Hello and welcome to the Red Journal's regular monthly podcast. This month, as many of you will have seen already, we've published a special edition of the journal, and this is dedicated to the role of radiation in the new world of cancer immunotherapy. There have been so many remarkable developments in this field over the last decade, many of which greatly increased the opportunities for radiation oncologists and, of course, our patients. So we thought that now was an excellent time to cast an eye over the new landscape, to appreciate it, to understand it, and to try and imagine where we might go next. And to help give us this perspective, I have with me today a special guest, and this is Dr. Sylvia Formenti. As most of you know, she's not only a distinguished radiation oncologist, but an immunologist also, and one of the leaders of the new immune radiotherapy movement. She's also the professor and chair of radiation oncology at the Weill Cornell Medical College in New York City. So, Dr. Formenti, welcome. Thank you. So, can you just tell us, how did you get sucked into the world of immunology? Until recently, I mean, it hasn't been the kind of place where radiation oncologists hang out. Yet you've been immersed for a long time. So it's fascinating. Thank you for asking this question because I was very much influenced in medical school by an incredibly charismatic teacher who I had the pleasure to interact with like a year ago when I I gave a a talk at at an institution where he was uh, still affiliated with in his his early 90s. And uh, he was so touch that I recognize in my talk how much he influenced me. And uh, he he is a professor of clinical medicine and taught in medical school what in the daily study in Milano, so Milan University, was really the course on clinical medicine, how to put together all the information from pathology, radiology, and to learn about diseases. And he always found a way to introduce an immune aspect in each of the diseases, where it was inflammation for atherosclerosis, in cancer, of course, why the immune system gets blind in cancer and so on, and really very much formed all of us through his teaching. And because he was a fantastic communicator, we all took very careful notes of his lectures, and I still have my books (laughs) with his notes (laughs) many years later, as you can imagine. And I went through, before giving this talk a year ago in Milan, when I I knew he was going to attend, I um, went back to my notes and I highlighted this punchline about the immune system in each of the diseases. And he left a sign that I I really couldn't erase and somehow made me understand where we have evolved to the immune system, you know, as part of evolution and even incorporating pieces of viruses in our DNA somehow signals through the immune system. So it it just stayed so prominent that throughout every single step, I think a little bit like an immunologist. And of course, I have to admit, my my training is so far away from modern immunology that I'm always ignorant in immunology. (laughs) I'm always trying to read because I'm certainly not up to speed with, with the entire evolution of this incredible field. Now, we have a lot of um, listeners and readers in Italy. So do you you want to give us your mentor's name so that he can be recognized? Yes, Claudio Rugarli. And uh, he's a very famous, he's actually still an immunologist and recognized immunologist and has trained a lot of people, most of them enthusiastic supporters of his educational capacities and his communication skills. God, we should all have a mentor like that. That's right. Well, I don't want to sound cynical because I'm not, but (laughs) when it comes to immunology and cancer, I do feel like I've been here before. Mm. So you'll remember, as I remember, back in the 1970s, there was an enormous amount of enthusiasm about BCG, you know, stimulating the rejection of urine tumors, until it was later discovered that these tumors were highly immunogenic, probably the result of the way they were induced. And then in the 80s, there was all that enthusiasm about IL-2 and interferon and other cytokines. And there were New England Journal articles, but this was another false dawn. And we put a hell of a lot of patients in ICU for very few responses, and they weren't even durable ones. So what went wrong before, and why do you think that this time is different? So what what I completely agree with you, and what what is the new epiphany? Why is now so trendy to talk about immune oncology, at least? What, What I think happened in the past 
20 to 30 years is some form of deconvolution of the complexity of the immune system, including, to me, look, looks like infinite mechanism of evasion that cancer finds to avoid rejection. And in reality, I think with, with Schreiber's model of the immune system, most of the times recognizing transformed cells and rejecting them so we don't develop all these cancers and still a sizable proportion of human beings do not develop cancer or they die of something else before developing cancer or they don't develop symptomatic evident cancer. So the immune system is, is really good at protecting us from cancer until it fails and dissecting what happens when it fails as revealed to be much, much more complicated than what we thought. It's not just an issue of antigenicity. It has to do with so many steps that really are somehow replenishing research worldwide with a lot of investigators looking at each single component and try to combine the puzzle and get to an answer about once you have in front of yourself somebody with multiple metastases, what went wrong? But you could also ask, what went right that with all those micrometastases all over the body, you just see three or four of them emerging? So that, that entire texture, that entire fabric of balance between the immune system and the growth of tumors is coming to fruition now because a lot of human immunology in general is as mature than a lot of discovery has occurred in the last 30 years, not necessarily studying cancer only often studying what is supposed to be the main job of the immune system, which is to maintain some kind of balance with the microbiome and, and with infections. A lot of our um, listeners are solid, hardworking clinicians, not scientists. But could you explain in simple terms the sort of pivotal discoveries of Professors Allison and Tanaka, the yes. ones that won the Nobel Prize? We all know we're supposed to know about checkpoint inhibition. Right. But could you explain that? So I think I will focus more on, on Jim Allison findings because I'm a mm. little bit more familiar with, but what I think was extraordinary, uh, I hope Jim will never listen to this podcast <laughs> because I'm trying to make it very uh, to fruition of a clinician. So I'm, I'm certainly not daring to describe his science, but what he, he really was able to show is that maybe in immunogenic tumors, whether it's renal cell or uh, melanoma, some no small cell lung cancers, if you take away some breaks that are in place for the time the tumor has established itself, and just if you just remove those breaks from the patient, and you do it carefully enough and cautiously enough not to remove them too much, and I'm going to get to that point in a minute, mm -hmm. you then can allow the immune system of the patients to fight the tumor and get these incredible responses totally unexpected in metastatic disease. And what is incredible is that once you see these drastic you know, rejections of multiple metastases in melanoma, renal cell, and so on, in esophageal cancer, in other tumors, but you know, occasionally, so they don't get carried away too much. When you see that, what happens is that after these patients get into complete remission and you stop the treatment with these immune checkpoint blockers, so removing the breaks, it holds. So now the immune system is capable to keep the patient with no other treatment alive and well. So that's unprecedented in oncology because I really don't know, maybe in some rare systemic tumors like testicular cancer and so on, you can really convert into a cure in micrometastatic or metastatic disease or you know, oligometastatic or metastatic disease. But usually in solid tumors, once you have metastasis, your path is determined and it's very likely uh, you'll die of of your cancer. So to get this paradigm shift whereby just removing breaks in the immune system, so a form of blindness on the immune system, just by reawakening the immune system by removing those breaks to so-called cure metastatic disease, that's pretty impressive from the clinician. Now, in those cures, that's what I wanted to say, we also got some collateral damage, a lot of side effects. And I think the reason I want to talk about the side effects, because it really gives the landscape about what happens when you remove the breaks. You started seeing autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. And that gave hints that is a really a continuum from autoimmune disease to rejection of cancer. 
So once you temper with those breaks that are in place to make sure we don't attack our own organs, you may help rejecting cancer, but you may also start a little bit attacking your own organs. So I think the immune checkpoint blockade literature is is full of these adverse events, immune-related adverse events. Then thank God we'll learn to mitigate, we'll learn to predict, we'll learn to contain. But really our approval principle of the continuum of the immune system, whether it's fighting cancer or is attacking normal tissue. Turns out that cancer tricks the immune system to look at it as a normal tissue. So there's a lot of talk about, you know, in quotes, liberating tumor antigens with radiation. Mm -hmm. And this is a pretty appealing concept, but it sounds to me terribly simplistic. Is it actually for real? I mean, are there tumor-specific antigens that you can find and measure on cell surfaces or circulating in the blood? So what I think radiation can do, and we reported a proof of principle case, and of course, uh, really anecdotal and, and you know, a very early uh, form of evidence, but in mice, you see, certainly see it very consistently. What radiation can do is that if you have mutations in the tumor that are not expressed, you have an opportunity through the DNA damage response to evoke a full machinery to repair the DNA, all those very important enzymes that repair the damage we do to the DNA. And if in those pathways there are mutations, and it turns out that often there are, now those genes are transcribed, they are translated, become proteins, and if those proteins are antigenic enough, so they are chopped up to become good uh, neoepitopes and they fulfill the criteria to become a new antigen, so a lot of if, the immune system now looks at the tumor, the irradiated tumor, differently because it, it presents to the immune system new mutated proteins. So then you follow in the blood of the patient development of a clone of T cells that recognize specifically the mutated protein and not the wild type protein, the mutated protein. And it's almost like a new virus. It's looking at a new infection and then could attack the tumor based on that protein and contribute to the response. So is this a radiation unique phenomenon? I mean, is is there any way you could get this after surgery or cryotherapy? So much less likely with surgery, because if you remove the tumor, you cannot play this trick to re-educate the immune system. But (laughs) you you certainly can induce it with heat or or, uh, Mm. cryoablation or with some other DNA damaging agents, whether, you know, are platinum compounds. So whatever DNA damaging agent that elicit a repair response and you start expressing these genes that could have mutations, and then those proteins could become epitopes, ideally in a setting of cell death, because you also have to release the epitopes in the microenvironment for antigen-presenting cells to find them and so on. And a lot of things have to line up in the right direction because they have to match with the MHC class 1, which is a machinery to present these antigens. So there are a lot of if and steps, but you do see it in the clinic. And, you know, I think... The fact that we see it is very encouraging. So we talk a lot about, we hear a lot about the abscopal effect, and we had lots of papers on the abscopal effect that came for this special edition of the Red Journal. But I mean, historically, it's been a bit of a unicorn. Everyone right. talks about it, but no one sees it. So do, do you want to describe what it is and what is the evidence telling us about radiation's ability to induce it? So, you know, like in, in the 50s was reported as a response in a metastasis, in an established metastasis outside the radiation field. So it cannot be just scattered those doing the trick. It has to be really mediated by something else. And then we did actually publish in the Red Journal a very simple experiment where we prove it in mice that, in fact, was mediated by the immune system. So... I think it since has been used in many other ways. I think as cannot be confused with vaccination uh, experiments where you put a tumor into the mouse and then cure the, you know, irradiate the, the tumor, cure the mouse, and then rechallenge with the same cells and the mouse is capable to reject because that's a vaccination experiment. Yeah. The idea of abscopal is that you have synchronous established lesions, whether they are two nodules or they are metastases, you irradiate one and the other one goes away. But so I have news. Usually, with radiation alone, it doesn't happen, very few cases. If you start giving immune checkpoint blockade, then compared to giving immune checkpoint blockade alone, irradiating that one lesion seems to carry the day. 
And we, we showed it with uh, ipilimumab, which is anti stl 4 but others have shown it with anti-PD-1 as well. So if the radiation can really be a, an extraordinary adjuvant to immunotherapy, at least to immune checkpoint blockades. And now I would say more than one type of immunotherapy, so beyond immune checkpoint blockade. So I, I think we have a tool that is an immune modulating tool, and um, we should make the best out of it. So, so does the type of radiation matter? I mean, whether it's photons or protons or flash, does any of it matter or is radiation radiation? So, so most of the experience comes with ortovoltage in, in animals and photons in patients. But I would say that I don't see reasons why protons will, will work less, maybe even work better or particles may work better. And I'm very much interested in understanding whether flash, so the very high dose rate delivery of radiation as an immune component, but I don't think has been proven yet. So what, what about radiation dose and fractionation? Based upon the studies you've been involved in or seen today, how should we be irradiating tumors to best stimulate an immune response? And is it, is it going to differ from cancer type to cancer type? So, I mean, I'm certainly not the repository of uh, knowledge on this, but I, I think there's <laughs> uh, been a lot of debate on ablative versus non-ablative doses yeah. and so on. So what we, we have seen is that, at least in some tumors, there are thresholds beyond which you do not get this optimal immunogenic effect of radiation. So radiation is what we call viral mimicry. It induces type 1 interferon. It also releases these new antigens I described before. So the two together make it behave a little bit like a virus. And if you use too large of a dose per fraction, at least in the experiments we conducted, you don't see that effect or you see much less in that effect. So to exploit at best the immunogenic effect of radiation, we think is we have to go on the range of six gray per fraction to maybe 12, depending on the model. In some model, maybe even five gray per fraction. And it seems to be better if you fraction it, if you give multiple fractions, like mm -hmm up to five. If you give too many, you get into another problem, which is you continue to expose circulating T cells and reduce the number of T cells. And of course, in the middle of a vaccine, you don't want anybody to be lymphopenic. You want patients to have as many T cells as possible. Yeah, well, I was, I was thinking about other situations where radiation might harm rather than enhance an immune response. So that might also include irradiating large volumes of tissue or a big IMRT dose bath. Very possible. And most importantly, uh, actually, evidence when uh, Dr. Marciscano was working in uh, Hopkins, he published a beautiful paper with Ted DeWeese and Chuck Drake on excluding the lymph nodes from the field of radiation in, in, in mice, demonstrating that, in fact, you get much more of these abscopal effects if you do not irradiate the draining nodes, which makes sense because if you're trying to mount an immune response, you want to have the organs that mount immune response intact <laughs> as much as possible. <laughs> So I, I can't do a podcast without giving it a little prostate spin. Yes. So it, it's often said that prostate cancers are only weakly immunogenic. Mm. And that's why checkpoint inhibitors have been so ineffective in, in this particular disease. Is that really the problem? You know, it's, prostate cancer seems to behave very similar to estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. Mm. So, and they, it's not casual. They're very similar to the normal tissue and will make a lot of sense that they are tolerogenic, so they get some tolerance from the immune system. Having said that, I can tell you we have a, a pilot study where we're radiating the prostate and then take a few patients, you know, accrue to this trial to the operating room and study what radiation has done, and you do see changes. What I, I think is that we may not have the clarity of which breaks to remove to make radiation more immunogenic in prostate cancer. Certainly, Panmani Sharma, and Jim Allison have looked at multiple immune checkpoint blockade in, in prostate cancer. And, you know, receptors like VISTA seem to be interesting uh, to target. So we haven't heard about this one, but it goes beyond PD-1 and CTLA-4. And most importantly, I, I think, is how you interdigitate the immunotherapy at which point in the course of the disease. So... I mean, you mentioned melanoma earlier, and, and, yeah. and when I look at melanoma, I just can't believe this is the same disease anymore. And when you and I were in training in, in oncology, metastatic melanoma was one of those hopeless of all cancers. Yes. You know, right. we, we used to give it a little IV Vindicin so that we could yes. be seen to be yes. trying something, but we never, ever, ever saw meaningful regressions. It was just this unrelenting march to death. Absolutely. So 
melanoma has been transformed. Which cancers would you put your money on being the next to be transformed in the same way? Yeah, so so because I'm a pathetic optimist, I I, <laughs> I don't think say glioblastoma, or do say glioblastoma. No, no, I'll tell you. I think uh, with the kind of uh, resources and brain power into uh, drug development and understand and immunity research in general. So yeah. not only cancer immunology, but but human immunology that we are witnessing. So it's really an explosion. In, in really learning and understanding how the immune system works and the individual nuances of how the immune system works in each individual. I, I think we're just short of the correct checkpoints. There are you know, a myriad of other checkpoints popping up that are going to be relevant for different cancers. So we found a good match for melanoma, and I'm sure there is room in, in melanoma as well to expand and to improve. I am really hopeful that we will get to conquer pancreas, uh, you know, yeah. GBM and so on, all the glioblastomas, all the horrible diseases that now we're not capable to cure. So how does this open the field for radiation oncology? So, or to put it differently, does the role of radiation increase with the use of immunotherapy? Or if immunotherapy is super successful, might it decrease? I mean, I'm, the question I'm really asking you is why should the trainee go into radiation oncology rather than medical oncology these days? Well, so <laughs> it is a good question. <laughs> so in my idea, you know, is, and is not you know, necessarily that shared or, or popular, is that we will train radiation oncologists to also understand cancer immunology and uh, be prepared in tumor boards and so on and, and be capable to discern when radiation plays a role and when it doesn't in the context of immunotherapy. Because I think immune oncology is here to stay and we will have to revisit the indication of radiotherapy in that context, particularly if we're reducing the amount of surgery. So you have to realize that in some settings, they're talking about removing surgery because you can cure with immune oncology, kind of. So, you know, cytocidal treatment together with immunotherapy. And our role to sterilize the surgical cavity, that entire rationale is going to be challenged. And I I think it's really important we are at the table in this future of uh, oncology in general, because we really have to rethink uh, the rules in our field and rethink how to find space for participating in the care of our patients, and not only in the palliation of the symptoms, but very much trying to harness radiation to contribute to cure. Well, that, that actually is a wonderful sort of segue in, into our conclusion. So there, there, there seem to be so many potential scenarios to investigate. You know, we've got different cancers, different immune therapies, different radiation doses and types and sequences. So what would your advice be to young investigators? We have this amazing group of trainees or young faculty. Where should they be going with this? So, you know, I'm super biased. Of course, one beauty of uh, an academic career is academic freedom. And of course, any form of science should be fostered independently from uh, the times and the trends. It turns out that in this moment for our field, which, you know, I'm a really a radiation oncologist, it's, it's so important to have a generation of young people who have a passion and they are super educated. And they have the advantage of having learned modern immunology in school that I have such a hard time to try to catch up and follow. So they, they come super equipped to merge the training in radiation oncology and in radiation, classical radiation biology with an understanding of the immune system and immune system in cancer, they are the ones that are going to design the future of, of this field. On behalf of the listeners and the readers of the Red Journal as well, I really want to thank you so much for your insights. You've proven yourself, as always, to be an incredible optimist and visionary. <laughs> and it was a great pleasure to talk to you, particularly about a subject as important as this. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thanks, everyone, for listening to the Red Journal podcast. And please don't forget to look at this special edition. There are lots of fabulous scientific articles and some great reviews and great editorials, not least those by Dr. Formente. So I look forward to speaking with all of you next month.